decades ago when Thailand was facing a communist threat, American advisors came to offer advice. And they had sociologists come to study Thai culture, Thai society, study Buddhism. And one of the pieces of advice they had was a request that the monks stop teaching contentment. This was bad for the Thai economy, they said. I know a number of Thai people who laughed about that. Because it's a major misunderstanding that being content means that you just sit around and do nothing. And John Sawat used to like to make the point that the Buddha said, you should show initiative in your life. In other words, if there's wealth to be gained, things to be changed for the better, you do that. And you're developing good qualities of character as you do. Qualities that will carry over into the meditation. There are four of these qualities that the, the Buddha said lead to happiness in this lifetime. One is that you show initiative. You don't just sit around and be poor. There are lots of stories about a John Sawat's teacher, a John Fun, berating the, the farmers up in the Northeast because they didn't show any persistence in looking for a livelihood. They'd try a little of this, a little of that, and they'd run into an obstacle and they'd give up. He said, look, if you want to get out of poverty, you've got to work. And you've got to keep working. Again, the same principle applies inside. In John Mahabu, we're talking about how when our minds are scattered all over the place, we're poor. It's when we can develop the, the treasures, or the internal treasures that come with meditation. That's when we're wealthy inside, wealthy in terms of noble wealth. And whatever initiative you apply in that area is, is all to the good. Now, this habit of applying initiative has to come from outside, something you bring from your daily life. So you think, see things around you that need to be fixed, need to be made better. You go ahead and do it. And the second quality is that once you've gained something from your right efforts, you look after it, you maintain it. I got scolded several times from John Fuang about being wasteful, not taking care of things properly. Even the littlest tiny things. He talked about how John Mun would take old scraps of cloth and sew them together. He uses things to wipe your feet on, other things around the monastery. He didn't let anything go to waste. This is a principle that we should try to apply to. And then third, you lead your life in a way where you're not being a spendthrift. And at the same time, you're not a miser. You use your wealth in line with what you got. You don't get into debt, but you do provide yourself with some enjoyment from your wealth. Because if you can't enjoy your wealth, you don't see the goodness in helping other people find enjoyment in their lives either. It's hard to feel empathetic joy for others when you're not feeling any happiness at all. But you do make sure that you don't get yourself into debt, because that just eats away at you, knowing that you've got something you've got to pay back. And if there's interest, every day becomes an enemy. It's going to take a little bit more, a little bit more. So you lead your life in line with what, you've, what your earnings are. And then finally, you have good friends. people whose values are in line with the Dharma. So you can pick up good habits from them, so they don't lead you astray. Not, you don't want the type of people who say, let's go and have a little bit of fun 
and don't really care about the consequences. You want people who say, okay, we can find happiness in ways that are responsible. So these are all activities for your life outside, and they apply inside as well. To begin with, with meditation, you've got to show initiative. The mind doesn't settle down on its own. It has the habit of wandering around. That's what samsara is all about. It's the wandering on of the mind. It keeps creating new worlds to think about, and then to inhabit, and then you follow them for a while, and then you get tired of one world, and you create another one. We've got lots of worlds going on all at once. That's the normal habit of the mind. And so it's going to take some effort to get the mind to be willing to settle down, to find some contentment being with one thing. But it's interesting, when the Buddha talks about contentment, there's one area that he says not to be content for sure, and that's you don't settle for things as they are in the mind. In other words, when things are in a bad shape in the mind, you say, well, I'll just be okay with the way things are. Let them be that way. You've got to show initiative. He himself said that the, one of the secrets to his awakening was that he did not rest content with his skillful qualities. If there were further skills to develop, he'd work on them. So you've got to show initiative in your practice. But there is a type of contentment where once the mind has a single object, you learn to be happy with that object and you make it as good as you can. This is why in the first jhana there's direct to thought and evaluation. You keep asking yourself, is this as comfortable as I can make the mind right now, staying here with the breath? Or can I breathe in a different way? Can I focus in a different way? Can I think about the breath energy in a different way? Would that make it better? For instance, with the breath energy, if you feel that you're struggling with bringing the breath in, sometimes it feels like it is a struggle. Remind yourself that the energy itself radiates from within the body. You're not pulling the energy in from the outside. It's just the air that's coming in. The energy radiates from the centers that John Lee talked about, down around the tip of the breastbone, above your navel, the base of the throat. To hold that image in mind. And if you have a sense that there's any blockage in the energy spreading from those spots, okay, that's something you can work with. So it makes it more and more pleasant to be here with the breath. So you're engaging in the factors of jhana without thinking about jhana. And as you work on this, then you find that you can finally settle down and be at one, at ease with the breath. This is the result of your initiative. Then the next step, of course, is you maintain it. Just as you maintain your wealth outside and look after it, maintain your belongings that you've gained from your, your labors, you maintain your concentration. Learn how to fend off the voices in the mind that want to think about something else. They get bored very quickly. That went a little more entertainment. They say, okay, there's enough quiet, then let's go out and do something. We say, well, no, I've got to get really good at staying quiet regardless. It's when you fend off those voices that you s learn a lot. You see a lot of things you didn't see before about the, how the mind can trick itself into running away from what it knows is good. That's something that it finds in the short term more enjoyable. And then you use your meditation. That's the third step. You use your concentration to get the mind still enough so you can see what's going on, so you can start asking questions. But here, as with your use of your wealth outside, you have to have a sense of proportion. How much concentration do you have? How much can you apply it to a particular problem? How do you s notice that you're analyzing something to the point where your concentration is worn out? So you have to stop the analysis, come back to the breath. This is especially important when you're dealing with the obstreperous voices in your mind, the ones that you know are unskillful, and you have to fight them off. You have to analyze them. Where do they get their strength? In other words, 
Yeah, there's a quality of the mind that you know is unskillful. What is it that you like about it? And oftentimes the mind will lie to itself. So I say, I don't like this at all, but I keep going for it. Well, you go for it because part of you likes it. And what is it like? You have to be stubborn in finding these things out. You have to ask questions. And as I said earlier today, sometimes you have to just keep asking dumb-sounding questions. They say, why are you worked up about this? We say, well, of course I'm worked about this. Well, no, why? Well, because it's obvious. No, it's not obvious. And as you keep on being insistent, saying that you don't understand, the mind will begin to open up a little bit more. And you begin to see why it is that you like a particular type of thinking, even though you know it's bad for you. That's some of the work you do with your concentration. But after all, you begin to realize it's not seeing things clearly at all. It's like a knife that you've used so much that it's beginning to get dull. That's time to just drop the issue and come back to the breath. And developing the ability to drop things is an important part of the concentration, important part of the practice. It's like learning Thai boxing. The first thing they teach you is how to pull out of a close encounter with the opponent. He's, he's getting the best of you, you've got to pull out. And how do you pull out so that you don't just run away? And how do you pull out so he doesn't knock you? There's a skill. And, but it's the first thing they teach you. In the same way as you're practicing concentration, you have to have the attitude that no matter what thought comes up that's not related to the breath, you're not going to go running with it. Even if it's an interesting thought about some issue in daily life, some job you've got going, you've got to say, this is not the time for that, and be really strict with yourself. And that way you can learn how to use your concentration, in other words, spend it, but not be a spendthrift. Use it to develop discernment when you find that it's getting a little dull. Okay, you stop the questions of discernment, you come back to the concentration. Then finally, having good friendship. And there's realizing which members of your mind's committee you can listen to and which ones are the ones you can't trust. This is something you have to learn over time because. Some of the voices seem to be voices of dharma, but after you get to know them for a while, you begin to realize, no, they're going to pull you away. And so you hang around with the voices that keep looking for long-term happiness, a happiness that's reliable, a happiness that's blameless. And they keep your values straight. This helps keep you on the path. So these four qualities that are good for finding happiness outside, having initiative, taking good care of your things, not being a spendthrift, but not being a miser, and having reliable friends, admirable friends, they also apply inside as you try to get the mind to settle down. So they're good qualities to keep in mind. So again, a sense of proportion and what you should be content with and what you should not be content with. Which desires you should let go of and which desires you should actually foster. The Dharma has nuance around these issues. It doesn't say that desire is all bad or that contentment is all good. There's a time and place. And a lot of the wisdom that you develop in the course of the practice is learning how to figure out what the right time and place is for these things, so that you prosper both outside and inside. And the Dharma helps you as a tool in your search for that prosperity.